Greetings, 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 and greetings once again. Welcome to the silence of our friends. That's right. This is the episode of the show that's entitled The Silence of Our Friends. It's our podcast that we released each Monday evening at 6.30 Central Time and whatever the other time divisions are across the rest of our world, this applies to you. But it's 6.30 p.m. on the Central um, Central Time Zone. Welcome. We appreciate you so much. We appreciate you helping us to build the, the channel. Uh, of course, we advocate that you would subscribe to the channel, the YouTube channel. Then, of course, press the notification um, bell. That way you'll be notified each time we release a new um, episode. And then share it. Yes, you are very instrumental in helping us to share our voice and, and our collective voice uh, with others around the world. Um, our show title tonight is Waiting and Wanting, colon, Waiting and Wanting, the African Waiting to Become American and Rightfully Celebrate the 4th of July. That's right. It's a long uh, uh, title, show title, but a uh, topic at least, uh, but it, it carries uh, very pugnant uh, and very specific points. Waiting and wanting, the African waiting to become American and celebrate the 4th of July. Uh, let's talk about some current events, first of all, and I'll get more specifically into our show's coverage um, tonight. Um, current events, black on black homicides over the 4th of July weekend. And I want to just take a, a specific percentage uh, a specific demographic, if you will, from this past weekend's uh, data as far as deaths and as far as injuries uh, are concerned in the black and brown community. Uh, it's come to my attention very recently that um, even comedian Ricky Smiley's daughter was caught up in crossfire over this weekend last night. Uh, sustaining three shots at a traffic uh, stop that had nothing to do with her, Bull bullets riddled, and uh, fortunately she is alive and I think recovering from surgery today. Along with that, an eight-year-old girl was shot Saturday night near the Wendy's where Richard Brooks was killed last month. Eight-year-old girl, uh, and, I, and I want to do re my respects to all of these families and our condolences in the cases where deaths um, came as a result of this violence. In Chicago, an another late Saturday shooting in, in the South Side neighborhood of Inglewood left four people dead, including a teen and four more people injured. The shooting happened about 11.35 p.m according to police records. In the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., the district, 11-year-old Devon McNeil was killed Saturday night after a group of five young men began shooting in the southeast part of the city. Uh, and then our home area here, the Hoover uh, subsidiary of Birmingham, Alabama, um, in the Galleria Mall, the River Chase Galleria Mall, which was once a very... Um, lofty place to visit. I think it's one of America's largest shopping malls, if not the largest. That's right, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, police arrested a suspect in, in the shooting death of an eight-year-old in the mall on Friday. So it's been a deadly weekend. If you just go to your Wall Street Journal, perhaps even the CNN uh, webpage, you will see statistically and across the country, various cities were involved in a very, very bloody weekend. And it's a, a, a bit ironic and maybe even paradoxical that all of these violent acts took place over the 4th of July weekend, and much of which, many of which, had to do with people of color. Now, um, before we get into the topic tonight, an issue comes up. We talk about people of color and their involvement with violent crimes. You see, because the whole purpose of our show, this podcast, is to give credence to people of color in America, to build up uh, who we are as a people, um, also to sort of probe into the reasons for which black on crime happened 
and um, why it is that we are so, as a people, disrespected in this country, uh, why answers to slavery, enslavement, whether physical or psychological, uh, all of the bevy of questions that have to do with the African in America or black and brown people in America and their plight. And so uh, I, in an attempt to always paint with a not so broad brush as far as the inclusion, but to be fair, you know, again, my issue is not that people of color are superior to all other ethnic groups, nor is it that other ethnicities are inferior to blacks and black and brown people. I believe in a sense of equity that, that by one blood, our God, whom I believe to be the creator of the universe, created all nations and all men. However, there are certain things we have to probe into in order to uh, effectively treat and deal with the sickness uh, that has plagued, long plagued, these yet to be United States of America. Whenever you begin talking about violent acts that have to do with people of color, this the conversation shifts to black on black crime. And I have something for that tonight. Um, th this idea of black on black crime represents an often attempted shift when the subject of unarmed people of color being killed by white officers comes into play. This happens all the time. I watch it happen in media. I watch it happen in conversations. And if you are talking, if black people are talking to white people and you bring up this subject of the unjust treatment or unjust treatment of people of color while under arrest, um, while in the custody, care and control of those who are sworn to protect and serve um, all people indigenous of their background, social, ethnic um, situation, so forth and so on, the conversation cleverly shifts and sometimes even abruptly shifts to, oh, well, let's talk about black on black crime. Well, let's address that. Let's address that. Uh, according to an article in the Miami Herald uh, by the auth its author, Leonard Pitts Jr., um, he makes this point. It is true. 90% of black murder victims are killed by black assailants. Stay with me. Stay with me. It is true. 90% of black murder victims in the United States of America are killed by black assailants. So that is black on black crime. However, white people kill each other also. 83% of white victims are killed by white assailants. So it's not that, the, the disparity is not that great, but the lens, the optics always goes to people of color and that is intentional. So white people kill 83% of their crimes are, are committed within their race as well. So forth and so on. I fact check this and the like. So then we, we, we can draw the safe conclusion that racial groups kill racial groups, specific racial groups impact their crimes on specific racial groups themselves being the same. So uh, black on black, white on white, Asian on Asian, uh, probably it's true, Native American on Native American, Latino, otherwise Hispanic on Latino and otherwise Hispanic, because here's the fact. People do not drive to find areas to commit crimes when they're personal. Crime is a matter of proximity and opportunity. People victimize their own rather than drive across town to victimize other people. It's just the facts, okay? So let's deal with the facts, the facts tonight. Um, again, while pondering uh, our topic for tonight's episode, several thoughts inundated my mind, perhaps even troubled my mind. Number one, or one, why have I never, as an individual, George and Matthews II, why have I never felt comfortable celebrating, quote, end quote, the 4th of July holiday? I've always felt some type of way. Uh, some ambivalence, some discomfort, some level of an uncomfortable fit 
Um, yes, we appreciate being off, and as an employer, uh, it becomes our company's responsibility to provide for and sustain people for national holidays, the 4th of July being one. So I'm sure and certain that people of color enjoy being off with a paid holiday, okay? But I've never felt comfortable as an individual as far back as I can remember. And I remember um, in 1976, I, I was um, 14 years of age. And that was America's that was America's bicentennial year. And oh, it was an awesome celebration. It matters not where you were and where you traveled. And especially if you were able to travel, you saw it in, 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 a, in a broad array of celebrations and even television kicked in and made it very jubilant along those lines. But I never felt comfortable as an individual, not knowing necessarily the reason. I do now, I did not then. Um, secondly, was this holiday, this holiday, the, the, the 4th of July, the celebration of the nation's independence, America's independence from Britain, was it ever intended, please hear my question, my probe, was it ever intended to include people of color? Was it ever? And question two for my self probe, I think will give us an earshot or at least an eyes, uh, an eyeshot view point of perhaps what is wrong in our country from a racial, racial injustice perspective. Question three. Would anyone understand the reason this celebration would be questioned and the relevance for such a query uh, outside of myself and my own thinking, my own thoughts inside my own little capsule called my brain? Would anyone else outside of people of color understand and be able to have some traction with us if we ever question the relevance and semblance of this nation's holiday in its celebration of independence as it relates to people of color. Fourthly, of what benefit is this particular holiday to black and brown people today or ever? Was it ever beneficial? I've got to move on. Fifthly, uh, these are just questions I've always had in my mind and I I'm thankful for this opportunity to put them out and share them with you. Was the newly framed American quote unquote culture then, or is it now aware of sympathetic to, or believes in the equality of ethnic group? Has this consciousness, the consciousness of this country ever been directed to be sensitive toward, understand, or believe in the equality of all races within this melting pot referred to as America. Some would say, why is this podcast or others like it necessary? Is it necessary? And why cannot we forget the past and move forward in quote unquote brotherly love? I can't tell you the number of times I've heard that in my life and better race relations, especially in a nation of Christians. Why don't you, you guys, you black and brown guys, just let it go. It's happened over 400, 300 some odd years ago, and it's time to move on in the, in the spirit of Christianity. We've heard a uh, relevant quote unquote, question mark ministers, of late the last few weeks speak to people of color attempt to speak to people of color uh and and in the hopes of motivating um black and brown people in america to just let this heinous crime of injustice in america reaching all the way back to the first 20 people of color that were transported here to this country just let it go let's pray about it sing kumbaya and uh, call it a day well I, I question people of that nature. First of all, I had the kidney stone. You remember that? And um, if you've never had one, you should never try to explain it until you've had the experience because you cannot relate to what a large kidney stone passing through the lower GI is really like in the same sense in semblance. People that are not of color 
cannot relate to the idea of the injustice that people of color grow up understanding and and processing and having to cope with and having to with which they have to deal on a day-to-day basis on any and all levels on any given day it is very difficult for you to have not had a large kidney stone to relate to that idea of of pain and discomfort likewise it is impossible probably for you to be able to relate to an idea of something that you have not experienced, but you can learn, you can learn, Uh, you can become made conscious. You can become conscious by the sharings of others. And this is, this is one of the things that I think this podcast represents. And it's one of the reasons I believe our country is still in the dire straits that it is because there are people attempting to address concerns of which they have never experienced. And so it's very, it's very easy to say how, um, how um, one should respond and react to a thing if you've never had to undergo that particular thing. Uh, let's talk a bit about silence, which is the um, one of the major uh, pieces to our podcast. Silence, the silence of our friend. Silence, um, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Dr. King, ML King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And silence takes on a multiplicity of forms and formats. Uh, Silence can be inactivity. Uh, Silence can be looking the other way. Silence can be laughing when things are not funny because of the company, present company one is uh, engaged with, uh, within w- which one is engaged. Um, doing nothing is the same as supporting what was or is being done. Author unknown. Doing nothing is the same as supporting what is or what was being done. Silence. Uh, in the end, I love this one. You know this. What will be remembered will not be the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends, the silence of our friends. And then finally, if we're not for change, if we are silent about it, then we're against it. If you're silent about change, if you're not for change and then you're silent, then you're really saying you are against change. And so this program exists to set forth certain paradigms and to, uh, maybe work very judiciously to adjust certain uh, thinking and, and certain lines of thought. Uh, I believe, this is George Matthews, I believe we're responsible to set new patterns of thinking, which can only be achieved as incorrect thought patterns and processes are confronted and destroyed. You know, um, I remember as, as, a, as a young young boy um, being brought into a school system that was largely white. My mother was a teacher, an educator. And so in the days of the uh, turbulent 60s, latter 60s, 68, 69, uh, I was six years old um, going to kindergarten and then seven years old going to the first grade. And uh, I attended school um, there in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, attending there, it was amazing to me the number of white children, middle class white children, uh, so some of which might have been upper middle class white children who had never seen people of my dark pigmentation. And they would ask us crazy questions, crazy questions like, um, uh, what does your hair feel like? May I touch it? Uh um, why are you so dark? Um, did you spill paint on your hands? You know, people who are not of this persuasion don't understand that kind of, uh, having to cope with that as a six year old, as a seven year old. And then, um, the whitewashing of history and, uh, coming up through that whole process. I'm getting, I'll get more into that later, but we have to be responsible to confront 
idioms and ideologies that are incorrect. When people are wrong, they must be confronted. To say nothing is to agree with an ignorant value or an ideal, an ideology or a system of thinking that is incorrect. And to not do anything or not confront it is to go along with it, which is to perpetuate it uh, for days and months and years to come. Allow me, if you will. The Apostle Paul uh, mentioned something, and I'm not going to preach this. And uh, I think it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So this means that when you uh, uh, broach the subject of racism, race relations, inequities, injustices, so forth and so on, you're, you're dealing with principalities and powers of darkness the the enemy of all that is good whomever you however you refer to him but the enemy of all that is good uh puts himself in a position to cause divisions between people by way of racism bigotry differences um and the scripture refers to that as principalities powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So what we're dealing with tonight and all nights when you deal with this mammoth subject is really a spiritual darkness, which comes from our enemy, whom I believe to be Satan, or once called Lucifer. Uh, uh, please hear, uh, allow me to read that same passage from uh, the message translation, the message translation, Ephesians chapter six, verse 10, again, not to, looking to preach this, uh, verse 12, verse 12, I said, verse 10, verse 12, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This situation of racism and race relations, relations and inequities and prejudice, so forth and so on. This is not an athletic, an afternoon athletic contest like playing ball, uh, sandlot ball. You you play the ball, you compete, uh, you play the sport, compete, and then walk away and forget about it. Th this translation says, no, it's not that kind of thing. You'll not forget about this one in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finished against the devil and all his angels. So we're really up against something. This is why racism in America has perpetuated itself and it has been well and growing for centuries. Now, allow me to um, duck back into the narrative for tonight's show. I'll start it this way, restart this way. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator, that's what the uppercase C, letter C, with certain un in, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, you know the, the former, or the latter, and the pursuit of happiness. So begins the Declaration of Independence, the document that eventually led to the creation, or at least the formation, of the United States, but the words point to a paradox, a paradox, conflicting ideas upon which the nation was built. I'm trying to trace back, backwards, and discover why uh, racism is perpetuated today and where from whence did it come? I think I have an idea. Hang in here with me, please. Uh, even as the colonists, these 13 British, formerly British colonies, fought for freedom from the British, they maintained slavery and avoided the issue altogether in the Constitution. Wait one minute. <laughs> Hold on, George Matthews. Are you telling me that in 1776, when the nation, the, uh, the Americas, declared their independence from Britain, July 4th, officially, 1776. Are you telling me when they penned this statement that all men 
are created to be equal. They, the framers and fathers of this country, most of whom were slavers, owned slaves. So that's a paradox. You're saying one thing out of your mouth, but the reality is back home. You're doing something altogether different. And I heard this inside of me. You call it what you want, but I believe the root cause, cause of course, we know the author of it is the enemy, Satan, who stirs up differences and uh, magnifies differences and polarizes people one against the other. However, I believe the fuel that he uses to fund and uh, motivate his cause is that the fathers and framers of America coming from Britain, where they had slaves in Britain as well, never saw men of color as human. I don't think this country as far as its present leadership at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in the District of Columbia. To this day, most racists are racist. Bigots are bigoted. Christian bigots who love Jesus, but they have never seen, understood, and valued, please hear me, people of color, black and brown people, as equal human beings. Because when they framed this statement, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, self-evident. In other words, you don't have to speak or address this concern because all men are created equal by the creator. The all men they were speaking of were men who had white skin such as themselves because there is no way you could be involved in slavery as heinous. And I'm going to paint the picture tonight, so stay with me. And if you haven't contacted someone and told them that we're on the air, text them now, share the link because it's getting ready to be deep. I feel this one tonight. I have some answers, I believe. And the reason that I'm not withdrawing myself from people who are not of color, who, who are Christians, who are believers in Jesus, and who say they love Jesus, is that I believe their mindset. I'm going to give you some glossary words in just one moment's time to help us to uh, make better make our point. I, I believe that part of it is they've never seen black and brown people as equitably human. Okay. Now, and I have some help on this. This country's mindset never saw blacks or brown people as equal humans denoted by the, get ready for this, three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise was reached among state delegates during the 1787, notice the date, 1787 United States Constitutional Convention, where they would ratify, make amendments or adjustments to the Constitution. Constitution, uh, 1776 Declaration of Independence to here, 1787 in this Constitutional Convention, whether and if so, how slaves would be counted, whether they would be counted and how they would be counted when determining a state's total population for legislative representation and taxing purposes. This was important as this population number would then be used to determine the number of seats that the state would have in the United States House of Representatives for the next 10 years. The compromise solution was to count three, hear this now, out of every five slaves as people for this purpose. Mm. Its effect was to give the Southern states a third more seats in Congress and a third more electoral votes than if slaves had been ignored. But hear this, but fewer than if slaves and free people had been counted equally. 
So it was all a snafu. It was a play on words. Um, they manipulated the numbers and because the South had so many slaves or black Africans imported in, they could not give man for man, black man to white man ratio. So they said, we'll take three, th three out of five slaves to make one black to, to, to represent himself empirically against the one free white man. So they never saw blacks and whites. These are the fathers and framers of the country. Notice this, the compromise was proposed by delegate James Wilson and seconded by Charles Pickney on June 11th, 1787. Now, let's go back and deal with these dates. The date celebrated for this nation's independence <laughs> is July 4th, 1776. On this date, 13 American colonies uh, served their political, uh, excuse me, severed their political connections to Great Britain, the sponsor of the 13 uh, colonies or these colonists came from Great Britain in search of a new land. And it was supposed to have been an expansion of Great Britain's uh, territory. When the 13 colonists get here, of course, they decide this is time to be free, uh, aided and abetted by the fact that once they were here, they were still being taxed in Great Britain, which brought about the great American revolution. All right, no. Uh, June 11th, Continental Congress creates the committee, fathers and framers now, principally Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert R. Livingston to draft a Declaration of Independence. So this happened on June, June 11th, 1776. So about um, just shy of 30 days, these fathers and framers have crafted this document to sever their relationship and ties with Great Britain in order to start a new world. June 28th, the final draft of the Declaration of Independence was submitted to the Continental Congress. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. July 2nd, Continental Congress resolves these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Now, the 13 colonies have now decided uh, uh, and that they should be free while elsewhere <laughs> in America. <laughs> Among them, slavery in the United States was going on. Slavery in the United States was the legal institution of human chattel enslavement. That means you're, you, you're seeing and viewing these black slaves as if they're property as if they were a, a donkey or a horse or a, a, a plow or a wagon or a, a thing rather than a person. So there was never in their mindset that these black people who have five layers, three to five layers of melanin in their skin, unlike their white counterparts, because they look differently, they're still human. And you both, both all, have the same blood. Now notice this, Africans and African Americans that exist in the United States of America from the beginning of the nation in 1776 until the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War. So from the beginning of the nation in 1776 until the passage of the 13th Amendment in 1865, nearly 100 years, um, these people, just over 100 years, nearly 100 years, these people who were emancip emancipating themselves from Britain were holding, selling, torturing, killing, enslaving black people that they kidnapped and brought to America. Mindset. It's a mindset. Notice this. Um, under the law, an enslaved person was treated as property and could be bought, sold, or given away. Slavery lasted in about half of the United States until 1865. Again, that's the end of the Civil War. 
as an economic system for the most part, at least the end of slavery. Uh, as an economic system, slavery was largely replaced, and hear this, by sharecropping and convict leasing. So, so, so this, 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 is, this was the mindset. When President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, bringing an end to slavery in America, uh, the, the framers and fathers and those who were in leadership who were white said, okay, we still have uh, the cash crop of cotton in the South as well as tobacco. We need some of these black animals who are not human, such as we, after we have formed these United States, we need someone to, to harvest this difficult work. And so slavery by another name was born. Uh, we call it uh, sharecropping where people still worked on the land of their former slave owners. They didn't own them legally, but they owned them economically because they caught these people were released. Black people were released. My forebears, I intended to bring this. I'll do it on another show. I've traced down, um, by, by one of my relatives, um, the funeral programs from my, my paternal, uh, grandmother and grandfather, both of which were born in the, uh, late 1800s. So this means that I'm my nativity, my birth was just really three generations away, uh, from slavery. So, uh, not my father, but his father was born at the edge of the, uh, civil war. So, uh, he served as a, I just found out from one of my um, cousins uh, after visiting a family cemetery that's in another state that my paternal grandfather was buried there with military honors. So he was probably a man of color who fought in one of the wards or, or at least was represented, represented the United States in a time that was just past slavery or probably during uh, the rebuilding uh, of, of the country. Uh, and so a lot was happening for black people. I don't want to get off on that. The point I'm trying to make is when, when slave owners realized that their chattel were free, they still needed a way to make good on their purchased property and to have that purchased property that they never saw as equal valued men and women uh, on the same level with white people, which is a pervasive mindset that still goes on in our country on every level in the church. We've had ministers to make statements that make absolutely no sense. Uh, black lives matter, yes, but to these white ministers, black tithes matters matter to these white evangelicals who have uh, are in lockstep with this president administration and they, they are blinded from uh, seeing truth and they see color and they don't see people of color on, uh, on an equal valued basis. And so it is easy when you do not, when you dehumanize a person, when you don't see them as the same value as yours, it is easy easy peasy to disrespect them, to speak uh, uh, pejoratively about them, to, um, uh, to to hold them in a diminutive light. It's very easy to do. This is why you have heinous killers um, in, in court systems and smart lawyers, smart attorneys will always dress them up and they won't allow them to come in, in the, in the jumpsuit, um, the orange jumper. They don't do that. They're going to dress them up because they want to add value and make them look human or maybe even humane to the jury. That has never, that has never happened for people of color in this country. And so sharecropping, you work the land uh, for an agreed upon price because you were released with no tools, no land, no compensation, no money, no, not a place to live. So now you're free, but where do you start? You've been working for generations in this country and there were no reparations. There was no payment. So now you have people who will go back and indebt, indebt themselves to, if you, if you will, 
to their previous slave owners to work the land for them. Perfect fit for the slave owners, but oh, he has an ace up his sleeve. The ace up his sleeve is, I'm going to pay you. You're going to still work from kaint to kaint, just like you were when you were a slave, but this time I'm going to pay you, but I'm never going to pay you enough to get off this plantation. I'm never going to pay you what your work and your services truly uh, should have been compensated, rightfully should have been compensated. I'm never going to pay you that much. And then I'm going to create bills for you because I know you need some place to live. So I'm going to rent you a ragged cottage and I'm going to jack the price way up. So when you pay me, you have nothing left but to go back and work on the land. I know you need some food, so I'll, I'll, I will um, provide some food for you, but I'll create a bill for you. And so the bills never allowed the now freed slave to operate on his own. So this country, because at its roots on the soil level, never saw people of color as equally valued people as themselves or with themselves. Um, you, you had this, 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 this penal institution and, and my time is getting away from me. I hope this is helping someone. I, I need to draw this up to a conclusion. Uh, if you will allow me, because I still have a few minutes, allow me to do something else. Uh, when we talk about this, we have to talk about convict leasing because where you didn't have sharecropping and the system I just explained to you, then you had men who were looking for work, sometimes just walking because they didn't have anything to do. They've been released. But along with the 13th and 14th Amendment, there was a little hook in the law that said if black men were walking around and they didn't have an obvious destination. They weren't on an assignment for white people. If there wasn't a master who gave them a note, they could be picked up and brought into penal institutions. And then the white owners could go back to the penal institutions and get these black men who were once their slaves who have now been freed and make them work the land. And the government could use these same men uh, to build the railroads, uh, hard work, rock quarries, breaking up mountains and things. And thousands of black men were lost this way, whose records we've never found, never discovered, because they disappeared with a corrupt system at its, which had at its root the inequity of seeing men of, of color, black and brown men, not equal with themselves. This country never had us in mind. And now we cannot be silent because we have to give a conscienceless country a conscience. And that's what happened with Mr. the killing of Mr. George Floyd. He wasn't the first one. I've, I've done some research. There have been other men of color who were killed by white police officers by having the knee to the neck for almost nine minutes in the case of Mr. George Floyd. But now because of social media, now because everyone with a cellular device is a reporter, this thing went viral, global. And it enraged people to see the senseless, the coldness in this man's eyes. He could be cold because he never saw that black man as equal with himself. They, they, they have been seen, people of color have been seen as less than. It took three out of five slaves to make one free white man, even in the constitution, this constitutional convention. So that mentality has long since been fostered. It's even in the church. There are people who have given their lives to Jesus, but their minds have never changed. And we can no longer be silent. We can't afford this kind of silence. It's too costly, too expensive. Uh, allow us to move further. Uh, with this said, I don't think people, I think another thing that has happened is in an attempt to whitewash America's dark, dubious, 
shameful history and in its treatment to people of color. Um, they've used, the Americas have used a term called slavery. And as a, as, as sort of like a, 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 a one size fits all category. It's a, it's a cash uh, term, um, which means you really, we really have to make people and keep people cognizant of what slavery entailed. And I, as I look at this and I go down this list very quickly, it had to be that people of color were never seen as equal humans created by the same blood as our white counterparts here in these yet to be United States. It had to be that because you can only render this kind of treatment to people that you don't see as equal as yourself. So the question becomes, are people just tolerating you outside of your race or are they embracing and accepting you though different? Notice this, slavery included throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, 1600s, 1700s, uh, people were kidnapped from the continent of Africa, forced into slavery in the American colonies, just the 13 British colonies. So while this nation was a fledgling nation, it participated in the heinous acts of slavery because of a mindset that they brought from Britain with them. Notice this, um, in the American colonies and exploited to work as indentured servants and labor in the production of crops such as tobacco and cotton, of which I've alluded. Forced labor was not uncommon. Please hear this. Africans and Europeans had been trading goods and people across the Mediterranean for centuries. So enslavement was nothing new. Here's the caveat. But enslavement had not been based on race. All of this time, enslavement, enslavement has existed in the world. It was never based on race. It was based on class. But now, with the bringing in of the introduction of the African out of Africa, enslavement in America is based on race for the first time in world history, not U.S. history, world history. And that's the mindset that we have to chip away at by, the, by God's power, God's ability, and our refusal to be silent. Notice this, um, enslavement had not been based on race. The transatlantic slave trade, which began as early as the 15th century, introduced a system of slavery that was commercialized, racialized, and inherited. Enslaved people were seen not as people at all, but as commodities to be bought, sold, and exploited. Though people of the African descent, free and enslaved, were present in North America as early as the 1500s, the sale of the 20 and odd, this is quote, end quote, this is how slavery started. The first shipment, if you will, were, were, were classified and codified as tw some 20 odd Africans from Africa. The 20 odd, the sale of the 20 and odd African people set the course for what would become slavery in the United States. Now, enslavement, slavery, let's talk about its heinousness. Let's talk about how could people who saw people as equals do this? And the answer is they couldn't. And the uh, reciprocal answer is they could only do this when they saw black people as not people, humans, equitable, equal. Um, there, there, are, there are articles of um, restraints. Um, these particular restraints were around the arms and legs. Notice this coarse metal cut into captive African skin for many months they spent at sea. So they're already, we'll talk about the uh, 
the uh, middle passage. But while they're on these ships being be, uh, as as kid victims of kidnapping, um, stacked on there like the proverbial sardine can, they are also in stocks around their necks, around their legs, around their ankles for months that they spent at sea being transported from Africa to the, the, the new world. Children, hear this, made up about 26% of the captives. You can only do this when you don't see people as your equal brothers and sisters. Because governments determine by the ton how many people could be fitted onto a slave ship. Enslavers considered children especially advantageous. They could fill the boat's small spaces, allowing more human capital in the cargo hold. So this meant they preferred children because they could get more on the ship. Now watch this. Overheating, thirst, starvation, and violence were, um, were common among slave ships. And roughly 15% of each ship's enslaved population died before they ever reached land. This is the reason they packed them so tightly, because they knew they were going to lose some by one means or the other uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, the Middle Passage. Now notice this, suicide attempts were so common that many captains placed netting around their ships to prevent loss of human cargo and therefore profit. You only are looking at humans as profit when in your mind they are not valued equal humans. Working class white crew members, too, committed suicide or ran away at port. One uh, article said to escape the brutality. It was not all white shipmen could bear the heinous treatment and the enslavement and what happened just on the slave ships. Whipping and rape were routine but usually not in front of white outsiders or even the plantation owner's family. Uh, one article I read, it, it, here's a quote I pulled from it. When I whip niggers, I take them out of the sight and hearing of the house and no one in my family knows it, end quote. Shackling. Now, shackling was another uh, means whereby you could handcuff two slaves wrist to wrist, neck to neck, foot to foot, shackling. And that went on, it would be for hours, days, sometimes months, if you wanted to teach a severe lesson. Shackling, hanging, beating, burning, burning, mutilation. Sometimes they would tie a slave uh, one leg to one horse, the other leg to another horse and make the horses split the slave in two in front of the other slaves. You talk about heinousness. We can't just call this slavery. We have to talk about the tears and the level T I E R S the tears and levels of enslavement. You can only do this when you don't see your black brothers and sisters as human as yourself. Notice this, shackling, hanging, beating, burning, mutilation, branding, like you would an animal with a hot iron. Uh, you would brand them to make sure, uh, even if they ran away, you could identify who the slave master was, whose property this slave was. Rape and imprisonment. Um, you know, the destruction of the family. Uh, a former slave describes witnessing females being whipped Quote, they usually screamed and prayed, though a few never made a sound. If the woman was pregnant, they're still whipping a pregnant woman. If a woman was pregnant, you can't do this if you see them as an equal valued human, equally valued human, such as yourself. If the woman was pregnant, workers might dig a hole for her to rest her belly, I'm quoting, while being whipped. After slaves were whipped, overseers might order their wounds to be burst 
and rubbed with turpentine and red pepper. An overseer reportedly took a brick, ground it into powder, mixed it with lard, and rubbed it all over a slave. You can't call this slavery. You, you've got to get into the finer points of slavery. We can't whitewash this. This was done because the consciousness of this country never saw men and women of color, black and brown people, as equal or equally valued humans. A metal collar, metal collar was put on a slave to remind him of his wrongdoing. Such collars were thick, listen to this, and heavy. They often had protruding spikes, which made field work difficult and prevented the slave from sleeping when lying down. This is heinous. They were sold. Families were ripped apart. Never seeing again each other in life. Infants were taken from their mothers and sold as chattel. Here's a glossary of terms. Just three words tonight. Cast. C-A-S-T-E. Cast. Cast, by definition, is an end. Uh, endo, endogamous I'll get it right endogamous and I wanted to use that word because it's a word that's taken from the West Indies uh, endogamous uh, and this word derives from the word uh, endogamy which means marriage within a specific tribe or a similar social unit uh, so a caste system is a hereditary social group limited to persons of the same rank, occupation, economic position, etc., and having mores, M-O-R-E-S, social behavior, social, uh, if you take in sociology, uh, human behavior, uh, you, you uh, associate the word uh, mores with sociology or human behavior. Distinguishing it from other groups more or less a class system. So slavery uh, also in this country had to do with classifications. Um, the, 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 the caste, old caste system, which means we want to keep black people in a certain level, in a certain box. Uh, they, they marry within their own species uh, their own uh, nativity they work you born poor you die poor um, you 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 born uh, misrepresented or underrepresented legally you die misrepresented or underserved or uh, not represented at all the second glossary word is culture an umbrella term which encompasses the social behavior and norms found in human societies. So it's been the culture, the culturization of America to not see people of color as equally valued humans. It's a part of our culture. Another reason, another reason that we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent for the caste system being played out, culturization, um, then the final word here is consciousness, consciousness. I don't believe the consciousness of the church in America, white church in America, the government in America, social groups in America, institutions of learning, communities in America. I don't believe black people have ever been a con a conscious part of this country's mentality as equal humans by God as the Declaration of Independence begins. Uh, consciousness is at its simplest form sentience or awareness. I love the word awareness of internal or external existence. It's an awareness of things inside or outside. It, it gets to be rather complicated, however. Despite centuries of analysis, definitions, explanations, and debates by philosophers and scientists, consciousness remains puzzling and controversial, being 
at once the most familiar and most mysterious aspect of our lives, quote, end quote, perhaps the only widely agreed notion about the topic is the intuition that consciousness exists. What it is, <laughs> what it is on various levels varies. And this is why I believe it is so important. Uh, consciousness of, of any subject, and the subject tonight is under the lens, how are um, black Africans treated, viewed, valued here in these yet to be United States? Uh, in my quest to address this for myself, and I, if I had 15 more minutes, this would be good, and I, I don't have 15 minutes. Uh, in my quest to address, I'll get as far as I can. My quest to address for myself the discussion about blacks and the day of independence, I found no better internal coverage of this issue. Nothing satisfied me like something I would heard about. And it's uh, a speech by Frederick Douglass, former slave, now lecturer, intellectual. Um, his speech was entitled, What to the Slave? is the 4th of July. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Uh, it was the, the speech was delivered on July 5th. Now that was irony by itself. You, <laughs> the 4th of July was the 4th of July, but this assembly was called on the 5th of July and the black man was the speaker who was heralded at one of the great products of the of people of, col of color, former slave. On the 5th of July, 1852, in Cor Corinthian Hall, Rochester, New York, addressing, catch this, Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Now, in the speech, uh, Douglas acknowledged the founding fathers of America, the architects of the Declaration of Independence for their commitment to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, let, allow me to just read this. There are about four more points to this. I won't get to them tonight. I wanted to end on this. But anyway, fellow citizens, and I quote, I'm not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic, speaking of the United States uh, or America. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too, great enough to give frame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to, to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. Talk, sir. They were statesmen, patriots, uh, patriots, excuse me, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Then he turns up field. He talks about then the nation's founders as uh, being great men for the ideals of freedom, freedom. But in doing so, he brings awareness to the hypocrisy, which is what this podcast is about tonight the hypocrisy of their d their ideals with the existence of slavery on american soil douglas continues in a ripping speech fellow citizens pardon me allow me to ask why am i called upon to speak here today question what have i or those i represent black slaves to do with your national independence. That was my query for all of my life. Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? He says, are we included? I thought I was the only one thinking like this. This speech goes back to 18, <laughs> while I'm doing all this big thinking, 1852, 150 years ago. Notice this. He says, were we included? Were we, were we included to, um, were we included in this idea of, of freedom in America? Notice this. He goes further 
And he says this, are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? This is ripping. He is talking to a white anti-slavery women's group in 1852, Rochester, New York, Corinthian Hall. Now, as we wrap this up, he, he, uh, he, he compares this celebration of Independence Day to slavery in the United States. Um, he orates that positive statements about American values such as liberty, citizenship, and freedom were an offense to the enslaved population of the United States because of their lack of freedom, liberty, and citizenship. They weren't talking about us from the beginning. And this is, he's drawing their attention to the fact that though you are a free country, you, you by, both by your practice as well as your consciousness have never seen the black in America as your equal, as your, as a, as persons, as a, as a community that deserve or even in your consciousness you 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 lack the awareness of what it means to be free for another ethnic group outside of yours douglas said and i end with this i have some more but i'll, I'll end here that slaves owed nothing to and had no positive feelings toward the founding of the United States. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? I quote, are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence, independence extended to us. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross, here's what it means, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. Well, my time is caught up with me tonight. Um, I thank you for yours. I'll pick this up because I probably have half that much to go next week. And so if nothing changes, we will we'll address this and in, uh, in your comments, uh, both on YouTube. Remember, help us to build the channel, strength of the channel and our presence. Um, if you think uh, what we're doing is worthy and in, in the attempt of helping people not of color to understand and gain consciousness of the relevance of people of color and the heinousness of what it means to extract from people their humanity and their equality in America. What has been lost in this country when you have hundreds of thousands of slaves and Native Americans even who have been killed in heinous ways in this country and you saw uh, just of the, uh, of the inventions of people of color in this country, what would this country really look like if of all the black slaves had not been killed. What do we lose to the Atlantic Ocean in the Middle Passage? What do we lose to the grave by heinous uh, acts of enslavement? Uh, what could this country be like in the future? What could your church be like? What could your workplace and space be like? What could your community be like? If and then what would our viewpoint as people of color be towards each other had we not been separated and intentionally Div, uh, devised and divided against each other and uh, uh, with the Willie Lynch letters uh, so forth and so on with the house slave versus the field slave with the light skin versus the dark 400 years of that perpetuated on us has now brought the Americas to where they are to see how we're treating each other and how we're treating the country. I believe that this can be rectified. It may take some doing, 
but we at least have to find a place to start. At the end of the day, we can no longer be silent. I appreciate your time. And until next Monday at the 6.30 hour, let's not be silent. To be silent is to agree with what is being done and what has, be done, has been done. So find your place. Uh, allow yourself to be led or graced into a space where you are addressing and correcting improper and inferior thought processes regarding people of color and their injustice, unjust treatment, unjust treatment here in these yet to be United States. I thank you and good evening. Blessings. Thank you.